In the fall of 1983, four men set out to hunt deer in Virginia. One of them would never return home. Authorities determined the hunter's death was accidental, but an insurance adjuster believed otherwise. A year later, the FBI had only one option. Agents had to get the suspect's confession on tape before their witness also became the hunter's target. On November 21st, 1983, near Roanoke, Virginia, 41-year-old David Fisher hunted deer with the three people who were closest to him. His 16-year-old stepson, his friend 22-year-old Bobby Mulligan, and 18-year-old David Wilkie. Wilkie looked up to Fisher as the father he never had. The group had been hiking since the early morning, but no one had spotted a deer. $50 was wagered on the first to shoot one. Fisher's stepson was bored and asked to go off on his own. He told him not to go far. The teenager had little experience in the woods. He walked a short distance when he heard someone yell, deer. Then he heard a gunshot. The boy ran back to see if anyone had won the $50. He found the group a few yards from where he left them, sitting on the incline of a small hill. 18-year-old David Wilkie had been shot. He was still alive, but they were miles from the nearest phone. Fisher told his stepson to run and get help. 30 minutes later, he reached rescuers. Lieutenant Michael Ashworth of Virginia's Department of Game and Inland Fisheries was called in. I received a call from the Bedford County Sheriff's Department uh, somewhere around 3 p.m. stating that there had been a hunting accident. I proceeded immediately to the scene. It was on the south side of Bedford County off of uh, Stone Mountain Road. Authorities were too late. David Wilkie died before help could reach him. The lieutenant asked the hunters to describe what happened. Bobby Mulligan said that when they spotted the deer, David Wilkie got excited and ran ahead. Mulligan and Fisher followed behind. As he started down the slope, Mulligan explained that he slipped in the dry leaves. His gun discharged when he hit the ground. To Lieutenant Ashworth, it was clear that Mulligan was a novice with firearms since he had made such a critical error. I said, you know, you would have had to have this firearm cocked. And he said, yeah, I did. I, I was carrying it cocked. When I had heard the deer, uh, then uh, I cocked the gun, which was obvious he was you know, very ignorant of safety, basic safety rules. The back, I mean. David Fisher told the lieutenant he saw the whole thing happen from the top of the slope. He was behind the two younger men when the shot went off. He saw Wilkie go down and rush to the side of the fallen teenager. He told investigators he placed a rag over the wound in Wilkie's back in an effort to stop the bleeding. The father figure tried to comfort his dying friend until help could arrive. But after only a few minutes, Wilkie stopped breathing.
Investigators examined the surrounding area to determine if there was any physical evidence to corroborate their story. Investigators found the spot where Mulligan had slipped. The size of the wound in Wilkie's back seemed consistent with a gunshot fired from where the hunter had hit the ground. Nothing they could find contradicted Mulligan and Fisher's story. Officials then turned their attention to the weapon that fired the fatal shot. They found that it had been undisturbed since it was last fired. When the lieutenant opened the barrel, he discovered the spent cartridge was still inside. The men were not placed under arrest, but investigators asked them to come to the sheriff's office for further questioning. Authorities were still uncertain if they were going to press charges against the hunters. Bobby Mulligan seemed to be very sincerely remorseful. Uh, he was crying at times and talking about the fact that uh, he had hunted very little. But it looked like uh, that it was exactly as what it uh, appeared to be a simple hunting accident. And, and we do have accidents that occur that way. At the station, the two men were interviewed once more in separate rooms. Their stories never changed. Unlike Bobby Mulligan, David Lee Fisher remained composed and assured his stepson that everything would be okay. Since the hunters had inadvertently wandered onto private land, they were charged with hunting on posted property. The man who fired the fatal shot, Bobby Mulligan, was charged additionally with reckless use of a firearm and hunting without a big game license. Sir, being charged. Without a permit. The charges were misdemeanors. Fisher and Mulligan would need to answer them in court. <clears throat> Until then, they were allowed to return home to Charlotte, North Carolina. As standard procedure, David Wilkie's body was autopsied. The cause of death was determined to be a transection of the aorta and lacerations of the lungs due to a single projectile. In addition to the 12-gauge slug, the medical examiner extracted cardboard wadding that had also been discharged from the shotgun shell. Examiners confirmed the slug was fired from Mulligan's rifle. A month later, Fisher and Mulligan defended their misdemeanor charges in Virginia's General District Court. The judge gave Mulligan a suspended sentence and fined him $585. Fisher was fined $220. The property officer returned the shotgun to the men and the case was closed. Two days later, an insurance company received a claim on the dead boy's life insurance. The policy promised to pay $100,000 in the event that Wilkie's death was accidental. Though Wilkie's signature appeared on the forms, he was not the policy's owner. His close friend, David Fisher, was the owner and the sole beneficiary. This wasn't illegal, but it struck the agent as strange since Fisher wasn't listed as the boy's father, nor as his business partner. John, the company problem. decided to contest the claim. Is, is claiming an accidental death? On January 6, 1984, they hired independent claims director Harlan Davis to determine if David Wilkie's death was, in fact, accidental. 
they contacted our office and requested that we complete an investigation to determine the relationship between Bobby Mulligan, David Fisher, and David William Wilkie, and also to check police records, obtain a medical examiner's report, and to, to get in it and develop the circumstances surrounding this uh, uh, death. Davis attempted to contact Fisher and Mulligan, but the claims director was unable to reach them. He was able to reach Wilkie's single mother in Florida. This is Diane. Yes. She told him that her son had left home for Charlotte, North Carolina less than a year before. Who are you again? Oh. The 18-year-old had heard that his estranged father was in Charlotte visiting relatives. Wilkie hadn't seen his dad since childhood. His mother said that he caught up with his father briefly, but his dad left Charlotte before they could become reacquainted. The father wanted nothing to do with him. That's when Wilkie met Fisher. David Wilkie was looking for a father, which he didn't have. His father and mother were separated. They'd, they were distant from him. He felt like he wanted to get to know his father, and this is, the, the reason he really fell into a relationship with David Fisher was because he was looking for this father figure and, and it became a friendship. Shortly after her son died, Fisher called to tell her that the teenager wished to be cremated but had no life insurance. The mother believed Fisher and ordered the cremation yeah. since Fisher seemed to have been close with her son. The claims director finally caught up with David Fisher to ask him why the policy had been purchased. Fisher replied that Wilkie had wanted life insurance because he was planning to get married. His fiance did not want insurance, so the 18-year-old turned to Fisher. Since Wilkie had no money, Fisher gave him a loan and a job working for him to pay it off. Fisher was the owner and operator of Fisher Services, a small business that employed several people, including Bobby Mulligan. Morgues and mortuaries called Fisher Services when they needed a body transported to their facilities from accident scenes. Fisher and his men worked mostly after 11 p.m. He didn't get paid unless people died. On a good week, the work was lucrative, but when there were no bodies to transport, he needed other ways to get paid. This is an interesting relationship. The investigator questioned why Fisher had paid the insurance premium if Wilkie was making income. The businessman replied that he only wrote the checks to the insurance company after Wilkie paid him first. I don't know what else, what else I can tell you. Fisher had an answer for every anomaly. In spite of Fisher's deflections, the investigator managed to get an important piece of information from him. The new address of Bobby Mulligan, the man who fired the gun that killed David Wilkie. The claims director found Mulligan at a pizza parlor in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Mulligan didn't have much to add to what Davis had already heard. 100 Main Street. The claims investigator concluded his inquiry in the spring of 1984. His firm gave their assessment to the insurance company. We recommended strongly to them that they not pay the policy and that further investigation be followed up to determine any, any other information that might shed some light on, onto this shooting, that it was not uh, exactly as it looked on the surface. The insurance company sent the case to an attorney in Greensboro, North Carolina. Fisher signed an affidavit vouching that he had seen the deceased sign the policy. 
The lawyer asked Fisher to describe the shooting one more time. Once again, Fisher indicated that Mulligan was 15 feet behind Wilkie when the gun discharged. The attorney confronted Fisher with the coroner's report. You might like to take a look at it. Two pieces of cardboard wadding from the shotgun shell had been found inside Wilkie's chest. For the wadding to have lodged there, it was likely the shot had been fired from much closer than 15 feet. The evidence was not strong enough to prove murder, but it was strong enough to win a civil suit. We are prepared to make you an offer. He offered Fisher $25,000 to settle out of court, the amount the lawyer figured it would cost to defend the case. Fisher accepted. Now, if you will sign here, please. They were afraid that if they did not settle the claim for some amount, that David Fisher would possibly sue them for not following uh, the uh, law in paying a claim when he had a legitimate claim. David Fisher had just made $25,000 from the death of David Wilkie, his friend and employee. The portion of that money he loaned to a friend would soon be paid back in ways he never expected. On a hunting trip to Virginia, 18-year-old David Wilkie's shooting death had been ruled accidental. The man the dead teenager had looked up to, 41-year-old David Fisher, had been paid $25,000 as the sole beneficiary of the boy's life insurance policy. Then a year and a half later, in the spring of 1985, Special Agent Robert McDowell of the FBI Charlotte Field Office received a call from one of his informants. Early on in 1985, I had a source. And one day, he came to me with a story that a friend of his had been hired and refused to take the job to murder somebody for insurance money. I, um, at first, didn't understand exactly why he was bringing me this information and why this individual is willing to talk about this now. Over the course of two more weeks, the agent continued to speak to his source. Well, the informant said his friend's name was Bear and that Bear's life was in danger. Agents wanted to speak to this person at the Charlotte FBI field office. But the source said Bear was reluctant since he was an ex-convict. He would only meet them in a neutral place. They agreed to meet in a park. Special Agent James Lillard, who's currently working undercover, helped Agent Bob McDowell develop the case. Working right beside Bob, we um, asked me if I wanted to go out with him to, uh, to interview his uh, source and find out a little bit more about this information. Lillard would keep watch from a distance in case his partner was being set up. Bear arrived on schedule. His real name was Gerald Stedham. So. Stedham said that a man named David Fisher was threatening his life because Stedham owed him several thousand dollars from a personal loan. He also accused Fisher of murdering 18-year-old David Wilkie more than a year earlier. Agents were skeptical. When you hear something like that, it initially sounds pretty fantastic and you kind of scratch your head. You're thinking, is, is this for real or not? Stedham may have been uh, exaggerating a little bit and maybe he exaggerated about the story in itself. Look, I'm not wearing he hoped the FBI would protect him in exchange for information about his old friend, David Fisher. When the agent asked if Stedham was willing to wear a wire to prove the story, the ex-convict refused. He had his run-ins with law enforcement officers before and he pretty much said right from the very beginning that he didn't trust police, FBI, or anybody else. So at that point, it, had a, it, was, a, it was a matter of trying to gain Stedham's trust to the point that he would actually work with us and not back out of the situation once he started getting into it. Agent McDowell needed to find out more about Fisher. 
A background check revealed that David Fisher had several aliases and 25 prior convictions for crimes ranging from larceny to forgery. Years earlier, Fisher had testified in the trial of an underworld crime figure and was then entered into the witness protection program. Not long after, his protection was removed since his continuing criminal behavior was in violation of its rules. Agents also checked records in Virginia to confirm Stedham's story. Yes, there was, in fact, a, uh, a hunting accident where um, a gentleman by the name of David Wilkie was shot in the back, supposedly accidentally. So that in itself verified that this, uh, this definitely happened. Um, you know, then the next step is to find out uh, if, if there are any motives here. I mean, you know, why did this happen? And uh, if there was any other details. McDowell arranged another meeting with Stedham to find out more. Stedham refused to come to the FBI office. Instead, he agreed to meet in the parking lot of a local restaurant. Once again, Stedham promised to tell the FBI anything they wanted to know about Fisher, but refused to wear a wire to secure evidence. If Fisher discovered the wire, Stedham believed he would certainly be killed. He didn't trust that the FBI would protect him if his cover was blown. They were interrupted before McDowell was able to convince him. I was speaking to him when suddenly screaming and yelling came from a local restaurant. And I realized that there was an armed robbery taking place at the time. And I asked Gerald Stedham just to step off to the side. The thief was stopped by the agent before he could flee. Get down. Stedham was speechless. At first, he wondered if the agents had staged the robbery to convince him to cooperate. When he was sure the arrest was real, his attitude towards the FBI changed. And at that point, I realized that I had gained his trust as somebody knew what he was doing. So from that point on, it was, it was pretty easy to uh, be able to get Stedham to believe that we were going to protect them and be able to get the information that we needed. How can I help you? Well, I really think it's meaning to help you out. At last, Stedham agreed to meet with agents in the FBI offices. For the first time, agents learned the plan Fisher made to kill his young friend, David Wilkie. In the summer of 1983, Fisher suggested that he and Stedham, his old prison buddy, could make $100,000 from a life insurance scam. The ex-convict would take out a policy on their young friend, David Wilkie, if Stedham would do the killing. Despite working several odd jobs, Wilkie was poor and estranged from his family. Fisher believed no one would miss him. His proposal was to, let's take him out into Virginia, let's take him out to an overlook, and um, we'll get him near the overlook, and I want you to push him off. And that way, he would die, it would look like an accident, and Fisher could collect the, um, the insurance money. And uh, which, of course, he would share with him if he did it. Well, I, I'm worried about. Stedham told agents that he didn't take Fisher seriously until he learned Fisher had obtained the life insurance policy on Wilkie. And at a point, Stedham said he didn't want anything to do with it. He backed out, which again made Fisher absolutely furious, to the point of almost a hatred developing between his old friend Gerald Stedham and, and David Fisher. Me. A few months later, when Stedham heard that Wilkie had been killed hunting in Virginia, he knew the death was probably not accidental. Stedham told agents that Fisher later offered him $50,000 to kill the hitman, Bobby Mulligan. The informant believed that Fisher would likely come after him next. The unfortunate situation was is that Fisher hated Stedham at this point. I mean, actually wanted, would probably kill him. So we realized that the only way we were going to be able to get at Fisher through Stedham was to have Stedham tell him that 
he was sorry that he hadn't paid him back and that he wanted to pay him back even if it's only $100 a week. $100 a week would give the FBI several opportunities to get Fisher friendly again. Fisher didn't hate Stedham enough to turn down the money. Eventually, agents hoped Stedham could then start reminiscing about what happened in the past. Since the FBI gave Fisher a reason to see their informant, the next step was to get Fisher confessing on tape. A few days later, Fisher asked Stedham to meet him at a coffee shop. Pick it up. Here's what I want you to do. Stedham was nervous about the wire, but finally agreed to wear it. Let's do it. Okay. Here we go. He was terrified, and um, uh, he, he was worried that Fisher would frisk him. He was worried that um, uh, Fisher might get suspicious. So basically, what we advised him to do was to just say, look, tell him that the insurance company is calling him and asking him about this. That way, it'll keep him off the trail of thinking that any law enforcement is involved. Under the watchful eye of agents, Stedham met with Fisher briefly. The murder suspect said little and avoided the incident in Virginia altogether. Fisher had been an informant himself at one time and suspected Stedham was wired. Outside the restaurant, the mood turned ugly. If agents moved in now, Stedham's cover would be blown. But if they didn't, they feared the suspected murderer would kill again if he found the wire. Agents surveilled murder suspect David Fisher, hoping that their wired informant Gerald Stedham would be able to solicit a confession from his old friend. Fisher arranged the meeting to receive money that Stedham owed him. But Fisher was suspicious of Stedham. To the relief of Stedham and agent James Lillard, Fisher never found the wire. First time that we had uh, wired Stedham up, and sent him in to talk to Fisher, he was um, a little too zealous. And he was asking too many poignant questions. So Fisher uh, kind of got a little suspicious and actually frisked him. Fortunately, um, we had the recording device in a place where he wasn't going to find it. Unless Fisher called to meet Stedham again, Special Agent Robert McDowell and his team had no other means to get the evidence they needed to arrest Fisher for his two-year-old crime. Five days later, Fisher called Stedham to arrange another meeting. Agents were hopeful. The cooperating witness tried to steer the conversation towards Fisher's past crimes, but Fisher once again avoided the topic. It was one of these situations where Fisher constantly would talk about the fact that he didn't trust anybody, didn't want to talk about anything. Every time Stedham would try to bring up the conversation about what happened back in those days, he would be tight-lipped. He wouldn't do it. Since Fisher said nothing to corroborate Stedham's version of events, it occurred to agents that perhaps Stedham may be lying since the ex-convict was reluctant to come forward in the first place. Yes. The FBI conducted a polygraph examination to evaluate Stedham's credibility. Yeah. Stedham admitted he lied about Fisher, offering him $50,000 to kill Mulligan. Were you hired to kill Bobby Mulligan? Yes. He insisted that Fisher had asked him to do it, but he could not remember the exact amount he'd been offered. I can't really remember. Just answer yes or no. One of the things we did in order to um, to try to make sure we weren't just chasing our tails was to, um, was to get uh, Stedham a uh, polygraph exam. And the fact that it was not conclusive could be that there may be some things that he's saying that he's uh, maybe holding back, but in general, what he's stating is, is pretty much going to, be, um, going to be correct. Agents believe Stedham was still their best hope of getting to Fisher, since the case lacked any physical evidence. But Fisher, the delivery man for the morgues, was extremely cautious, particularly with Stedham. For the case to move forward, the FBI needed another plan. 
So what we're going to have to do is create a situation in Fisher's mind where he felt they were closing in on him one way or another to try to stir the conversation. Agents figured that Fisher would relax his suspicion of being taped while inside his own vehicle. On a day that Fisher asked Stedham to help him with a job, agents decided the time was right. The technology was just starting to come out where actually voices would come across on a beeper. And Stedham had one. So we had a female in our office make a phone call to Stedham on his beeper, telling him to call home immediately, making believe that the voice that was coming over the, the pager was Stedham's girlfriend. So the car stopped. Stedham got out. For appearances, Stedham briefly spoke to the agent back in the office to let her know the message was received. When Stedham returned to the car, he told Fisher that it was an insurance agent asking to meet Stedham about an ongoing investigation. Fisher told him that if he kept his mouth shut, their new inquiry would go nowhere since the body had been cremated and that everyone said it was an accident. He says, and I'm telling you right now, if anybody tries to bring up anything, any witnesses pop their head above the water, it's going to be And those are the sounds that came over the tape. And we realized at that point what Fisher was doing was actually threatening the lives of all witnesses involved in the investigation that took place. The recording was good, but it was far from a confession. Agents had hoped for more. Unfortunately, over the next several weeks, Fisher avoided Stedham altogether. Agents pursued Mulligan instead. On tape, the shooter described a meeting he had with Fisher after the shooting. Mulligan told him that he had written out the details of what happened and gave it to someone for safekeeping. If Fisher killed Mulligan, those details would be mailed to authorities. Mulligan refused to tell Stedham what he had written or who held the letter. Then, just after midnight on June 16, 1986, an anonymous woman called the FBI to report that a hitman would be coming after Stedham. Agents scrambled to hide their informant at a remote location. They suspected that Fisher had made the threat. Investigators hoped they could secure an arrest warrant before the suspected killer got to Stedham. Fisher had arranged a killing before. Agents feared he would kill again. While agents began to close in on murder suspect David Fisher, the FBI received a death threat against their informant, Gerald Stedham. To protect their key witness, Stedham was held in a remote location until agents could decipher the identity of the caller. Two days later, agents reported their discovery to Stedham. What is it? The death threat had been traced to the residence of one of Stedham's friends. Stedham admitted that he had a female friend place the call, but he emphasized that the threat was real. He explained that his longtime friend David Fisher was suddenly acting like a stranger. To Stedham, this could only mean one thing. Fisher, the man who transported bodies for the morgues, was planning to kill him. Agents weren't happy with Stedham's deception, but Agent McDowell knew that the danger to Stedham was genuine. Stedham told me that Fisher as a part of being a, uh, dealing with the morticians and, the, and all the different funeral homes, had obtained a number of chemicals that he felt that could be injected into people without them ever knowing and, and that they would die without any traces of whatsoever. 
of what, what caused their death. The only way to assure Stedham's safety was to get Fisher into custody. Before they could do that, they needed more evidence. In the fall of 1986, a year and a half after the FBI began their investigation, agents finally tracked down David Wilkie's former fiance. They found her in Florida with a new married name. What we'd like to do is uh, just begin, just tell me. Uh... She told agents that she and Wilkie were engaged six weeks after they met and planned to move to Florida. To save money, the couple moved in with Fisher for a short time. But after her fiancé was killed, she moved out immediately. She told agents that she felt intimidated by Fisher. Just before Wilkie's death, Fisher had come to her with a proposition to kill the boy for insurance money. Like Stedham, she didn't believe Fisher was serious until Wilkie turned up dead. What we want to do is, he said, was get him a few drinks and then give him a good time. I want you to lure him into the pool, get him into the deep end, and then uh, I want you to drown him. And because um, he can't swim, then again, they'll run, call the hotel security, and uh, it'll look like an accident. There was something strange about him. Too. She believed Fisher was responsible for the killing, but she had no way to prove it and feared she could be next. Well, thank you very much. You've been very helpful. And we were very surprised. So many people were aware that Fisher was looking for somebody to kill Wilkie. That was incredible. I, we found it hard to believe that he had gone to that many people regarding some type of scam or some type of setup to murder somebody. Wilkie's former fiance had provided a few more pieces of corroborating evidence. Though Special Agent McDowell felt the case still had holes, he believed they had to arrest Fisher and Mulligan before someone else was killed. We were stretching our luck with David Fisher, knowing the type of person he was, to wind up reaching out and finally making up his mind and killing somebody. We decided that it was time to, it would be best to go after him, seek indictments and get him arrested and take him off the street as well as Bobby Mulligan. On November 5th, 1986, a Virginia grand jury handed down an indictment charging Fisher and Mulligan with first-degree murder. But with the evidence they had, a conviction was still questionable. McDowell had one last chance to get the taped confession from Fisher that would guarantee a guilty verdict at trial. I really wanted to try one more time to get Fisher to articulate in detail um, the fact that he had killed Wilkie for money. And I really would like to have he heard a verbal confession from him. And I felt that the only way we could do that was to, uh, you had to escalate his anger. You had to get him to the point where he just lost control and then we'd start being truthful. On the night of November 12, 1986, three years after Wilkie's death, agents wired Stedham after he had baited Fisher with the promise of some easy cash. Stedham had told him that a bail bondsman whom they both knew had a lead on a suspect who had jumped bail. The bondsman, covertly working for the FBI, would ride along. There were several locations in which the trio would go. And the plan was that the, the third individual in the car would be able to get out of the car, and leaving Fisher and Stedham alone. And that it, in between each stop, Stedham would escalate the situation by confronting Fisher Tell straight up. Everybody who will listen, you sit there. Mike Stedham sit needed there. to push Fisher to the brink in the hopes that he'd reveal his crime. But if Fisher first discovered that Stedham was an informant, the FBI's key witness might end up dead. The FBI plan to arrest suspected murderer David Fisher had been set in motion, though agents were still uncertain whether they had enough evidence to convict. Well, Their last hope rested with informant him. Gerald Stedham. Not be quiet. He keeps talking and talking. 
Wearing a wire, Stedham needed to convince Fisher to talk directly about the killing. A bondsman who Fisher believed was checking leads on a fugitive was in fact working covertly for the FBI. When the bondsman left the car, Stedham provoked the suspected killer to react as Agent McDowell had instructed. Stedham inside the car had, had done his job. He really tried to get him cranked up uh, to the point where he would lose control and actually start talking. But Fisher started reverting into that mode of being even more quiet. And we knew at that point that what Fisher was doing was going into his planning mode. To agents, the risk had become too great. If Fisher discovered Stedham was wired, the key witness, the case, and the arrest would be jeopardized. As planned, at around 11 p.m., Stedham suggested that they report back to the bond office that had supposedly hired them. When they arrived, FBI agents and Charlotte police would be waiting. Once he got out of the car, he pretty much said to Stedham, uh, in no uncertain terms, I'll, I'll see you later. Our units in the area were able to converge in on Fisher and had him pretty much surrounded. He wasn't going to run. Members of the Charlotte Police Department's fugitive unit arrested Fisher, Stedham, and the other bondsmen. They wanted to remove any suspicion that Stedham and the bondsmen had set Fisher up. The other part of the plan that night was that we had surveillance teams out following Bobby Mulligan, and we knew where he was going to be located. So after the arrest of Fisher took place, we immediately restaged and set up our arrest phase for Bobby Mulligan. Agents replaced the tape in the recorder Stedham was wearing. As instructed, Stedham had made arrangements earlier that evening to pick up Mulligan from a club where he worked part-time. It was after midnight when the two of them arrived at a tavern. He persuaded Mulligan to sit at the bar, where they'd be visible to the agents outside in case anything went wrong. When units from the Charlotte Police Department arrived, agents directed them to make the arrest. Mulligan, you're under arrest. Put your hands on top of For their informant's move. safety and to encourage Mulligan's cooperation, they arrested both men. Though Mulligan and his former employer, David Fisher, were now in custody, agents still needed one of them to talk about the murder. We wanted to set it up to the point where David Fisher would be within view of the fact that Bobby Bryce Mulligan was being brought in. And we wanted him to know in no uncertain terms that we had him and we had the shooter, and hopefully to make him realize that he was had. It didn't work. Fisher declined to be interviewed without an attorney being present. Agents secured a warrant to search the room that Fisher had been renting. Recorded in Fisher's diary, they found a series of cash payments to Mulligan. From a closet, they removed two strong boxes. Agents hoped that inside they would find the criminal evidence that could ensure Fisher's conviction. Agents obtained a search warrant and cut the locks. Okay, our first item. Inside the first box, they found documents that held David Wilkie's signature. And manila folder. They were likely samples used by Fisher to falsify the insurance claim. But the evidence was only circumstantial. In the other, they found only personal effects, nothing of evidentiary value. 
it looked like agents would have little else to offer as evidence at trial. A few days later, Agent McDowell got a message that 22-year-old Bobby Mulligan wanted to meet. So far, both Mulligan and Fisher had remained quiet. But after a couple days of thinking about it and, and in consultation with his parents, it was uh, apparently Mr. Mulligan's decision that he wanted to come clean about his participation in this murder and felt that it was to his best benefit to be the first to come forward with a confession. Start with, uh, Agents me. interviewed Mulligan at an office in the jail. He confirmed that David Wilkie's death was no accident. Mulligan said it all began with Fisher's plan to kill Wilkie's fiance. <laughs> Fisher had fronted Wilkie money to romance a young woman, kill her, then collect on her insurance. But Wilkie fell in love and backed out. Fisher was furious. To get the money back that he had invested in the teenager, Fisher recruited Mulligan to kill Wilkie for his insurance. Mulligan's story supported Steadham's. Agents finally had the corroborating evidence they'd been pursuing for over a year. Mulligan added that he had tried to call the whole thing off, but Fisher kept pressuring him to shoot Wilkie and get it over with. He said Fisher brought his ex-wife's son along as a decoy. Mulligan maintained that he actually did slip and fall. Mulligan claimed that he hadn't intended to kill Wilkie, only injure him. He said it was Fisher who actually murdered the kid. He believed that it was the finger of David Fisher going into the wound that killed Wilkie, that his own gunshot didn't do it. So he believed that Fisher actually did this. Um, but unfortunately, there was no way of being able to be, to be able to determine that forensically because Fisher convinced Wilkie's mother in a phone call at least two days after the incident happened that it was Wilkie's last request to be cremated. What was the final contract amount? He said Fisher had promised him $38,000 to pull the trigger, but ended up paying him only $7,000. David Fisher was tried for first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and murder for hire. Fisher got the death penalty. Mulligan pled guilty to the same charges and was sentenced to life in prison. I had been a law enforcement officer almost 13 years before I became an FBI agent. And the one thing I did realize from this case is that people can be extremely, extremely cold-blooded and evil, and that there is no remorse whatsoever in their souls, none. and that. Anytime you hear a story about something not being right, you have to listen to it. You have to listen to them and hear what they have to say, because you never know when something like that could be true. 11 years later, on March 25th, 1999, David Lee Fisher was executed by lethal injection. Fisher. David Wilkie had considered Fisher his closest friend. But to David Lee Fisher, money was more important than friendship or even life itself. On this day, a corpse would need to be transported, but this time, it would be Fisher's.